Hey everyone, welcome to this edition of the Dream Hustlers podcast. Today I have one of my new friends from our Fast Foundations Mastermind that I'm a part of, and so is Emily, Emily Kuhn. So welcome Emily to today's episode. Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited to be here. I know. I love doing these because it's just like, it's like literally girl chat for an hour. <laughs> and it just, it's like, it just is so much fun to learn. And I am going to learn a lot today on this episode because Emily is analytics and data, which is like the extreme opposite of my brain. My brain is creativity and colors and free flow. Um, and so I'm excited to hear from you and how important um, the analytics and data um, piece of the puzzle is to those of us who are business owners out there. So um, I'm going to let you share a little bit about your bio because I normally read them, but you and I got some mail going to, to emails went everywhere. We don't know where they are. <laughs> so we're just going to, we're going to, I'm going to let you share your bio so that I don't mess it up anyways. And then let's get into your story. So do you want to start by just sharing a little bit about yourself and sure, sure. Yeah. So, um, I think I'll start off by saying I'm a mom of two awesome kids, Alex and Katie. My son is 11, my daughter is eight, and it's super fun, mm. um, a super fun age. I love them dearly, as all moms do. Mm. Um, and then I'm a fur mom as well. I have an energetic puppy named oh. Zeus. Zeus Cuddles Coon uh, is his full name. And, then, and I'm a wife to my husband, Matt, who... Uh, who is really, I, I love how he's evolved, especially over the last couple of years in doing some work on his passion as well. So in addition to those, uh, those roles, I also love reading. I read 50 books last year. Oh, wow. And, or no, almost, I think it was like 48. Yeah. Um, and most of them were fiction, but they still count. Um, and I something loved, in everything. <laughs> yeah. Oh, for sure. Um, and I love working out. Oh. Like I work out a lot unless I'm sick. Yeah. Oh, so I love well, it. And it's, it's good. It's good for your brain yeah, to work out. Right? Sure. How we get better. Yeah. And then I, anal um, I volunteer in my local community with the junior league of Annapolis. I am the co-chair of a committee that has partnered with a community organization called Serenity Sisters who help uh, women in that local community who are recovering from addiction. So awesome. I love that um, volunteer work as well. So that's kind of my extracurricular non-work uh, yeah. bio. Love and it. For work, I am, I am a data and analytics consultant and I started my consultancy in 2018 after a 19 year career as a bank examiner mm. and I have examined ex uh, financial institutions from de novo, so the small startup institutions, yeah. to some of the largest uh, banks in the country. So I took what I had as a passion on the side because I was podcasting about Tableau, which is a data visualization tool that I use and data visualization and analytics. I was podcasting about it. I created a, now it's a global online conference that's free mm -hmm. for attendees. So I was doing all of that stuff on the side and said, you know what? I can make this my job. Mm -hmm. And I did in 2018. Oh my God. I love that. So it's like one of those accidental entrepreneur kind of stories. So like you just yeah. kind of do something out of, out of passion. And then all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, like I can actually make money doing this. That's right. Yeah. yeah. I love it. And it, all the data stuff, like when you say you are a bank examiner, like to me, my mind goes like, holy crap. Like that's, that's huge, right? Like you're examining the ins and outs of all of everything that's going on in the bank. Is that kind of, yeah. So, um, so Prior to my new, prior yeah. to my own gig, um, yeah, I would examine different parts of an institution, or I would be in charge of an examination and be responsible for the entire examination. So we would look at capital adequacy, asset quality, mm. management, earnings, liquidity, sensitivity, their infrastructure, their compliance with rules and regulations. So kind of the whole damn it. And was and that was probably very stressful, I'm assuming too, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, Which it was. led you into this journey of like, hey. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I would love to dig into that if that's okay. I would love to hear it. Okay. So um what I 
found over the last couple of years um, was especially in that last year in 2018, 2017 into 2018, um, I, I noticed that my creativity had, that's, that flame had almost gone out. I mean, so if you would imagine this person who loves digital scrapbooking and loves crafty type of things and having no, no desire or passion to do that, uh, I started to think about oh, that really kind of, it made me feel incomplete. So, and, and that was a direct result of stress. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was just stressed out so much. Um, it was also taking a toll on my health. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then in the meantime, you know, I would have a high travel season for my job, which I didn't mind the travel necessarily, but, uh, I would have this high travel season. My kids just did not want me to go. Yeah. Uh, and so I was missing my kids. My kids were missing me. I mean, it was so sad that even when I wasn't in travel, uh, because I lived about, or I live about an hour to an hour and a half from DC, depending on traffic. Uh, so I was based, uh, I was working in Washington, DC. Okay. Um, I was gone, like it, the, just the commute and my work hours. I was away so much that for my son's baseball season, it wasn't until their finals, basically, that I was able to start showing up. Mm -hmm. And the parents didn't even know who I was yeah. or who I, who I am. Yeah. Yeah. And it was because I was at work all the time. So um, I missed my kids. My kids missed me. And because of the stress and my response to that environment, uh, and as we talked about, this idea that I have this passion, I have this skill set. Mm -hmm. Let me see what it looks like about going out on my own. Mm -hmm. And I always know that, I mean, like I, I love working for myself in that time flexibility that I'm afforded. Um, but I always know that I have skills that can be used, whether it's working for me or somebody else. So that gives me a level of comfort, even though it was super risky for me to do. Mm -hmm. Always right. No matter, even if there is a bit of a back door, it's still scary. Yeah. It's still risky. It's still, Yeah. Well, I had to get over this idea that, I, I mean, I had to get over the judgment. The, oh, the I judgment worked, is huge. I worked in an environment, and I'm sure a lot of your listeners uh, may appreciate this. I worked in an environment where people stayed there. I mean, Life we yeah, we celebrated people that were on for 30 years, and in some cases, 40 or 45 years. Yeah. And now the job market is changing a little bit, but, um, that agency, and, and I still love the agency I worked for, mm -hmm. um, because you can do so many different things, but at the same time, when you are an examiner, like that's kind of your deal. You yeah. are an examiner and I left uh, at almost 19 years. So, I mean, it wasn't like I was there for a few years. I mean, yeah. I was really into it. Um, and so there was this judgment from my coworkers and others around me. Well, what are you going to do? Yeah. Oh, you're going to step away and be a mom. And, oh, and, and somebody I know who I'm still friends with said, uh, you got some pretty big goals there. Good luck with that. Yeah. Like as if, yeah, I know. Like, thanks. <laughs> I know. Well, I do I have, I mean, to yeah. be fair, I do have pretty big goals. <laughs> yeah. But that's, that's good. Right. I remember yeah. stepping away from my corporate, corporate job and, um, somebody had said to me, well, well what about your benefits? Like, how are you going to, how are you going to go to the dentist and how are you going to do all these things? And it's like, I'll pay for them because my goal is to, you know, make this business, you know, make me the money so that I don't have to worry about having that kind of stuff. Right. So yeah. now I'm in Canada and you're in the U S so that I know that's a little different, but still it was just kind of like, really? That's, that's the biggest concern, <laughs> you know? Well, and I will say it's not been all sunshine and roses either so far. Yeah. I mean, at first there was the initial conversation with my husband and uh, you know, that that's a pretty big life event for us. And it has modified the way that we live. Luckily, um, we had transferred benefits because I also had 
the benefits. My agency yeah. had fantastic benefits. We transferred our benefits over to him. So then he was the, or I guess we didn't transfer him. I stopped mine. He started his. Yes. So now he provides the benefits for our family. So we were, we are quite fortunate that we didn't lose any benefits yeah. with this event. Yeah. That's a, but, so what were some of the biggest struggles that you had when you were in that place where you hadn't quite made the decision that you were going to do it yet? But you know how like you're, you're almost in that indecision place for so long. Like it's like you're thinking about it. It's eating away at you. But you know, what were some of the biggest struggles that you had in like getting over that and, and, and how did you get over that and, and talk about that space? Yeah. So, I mean, I think the biggest part was I had not been a consultant before and I had that fear of judgment. I was living in that for so long and having been in banking, I mean, I started actually as a bank employee mm. when I was 15 years old. So wow. I say that I have been in banking in one form or the other for over 25 years. Mm. Um, so from 15 to when I left at age 40, 40, 41, mm -hmm. um, so it was a long time and that fear of, oh my God, what, what happens if I fail? And that I think among everything else, I think that is, even now I still have to reframe how I talk to myself. Yeah. Um, that is, that was the biggest thing to get over. Um, and the way that I kind of managed through that was really having a really good support system. Like uh, between my husband who said, you know what, let's, I think that we can make this work Yeah. Um, to my best friend and then to my mom and that convert. And I'm very close with my mother mm -hmm. and having the conversations with her and she goes, and I just remember her going, Emily, you know, this is affecting your family. This is affecting your life. Yeah. And it, it'll work out. Yeah. And so having that reassurance also, um, and knowing people had your back, you know, yeah, just yeah. A few people. Yeah. I mean, that was so important. And I think the other thing too was, you know, it, I could have lived in denial of, I can make this work. It can be okay. Uh, but then I think there was just being self-aware and being observant because like I walked into work one day and literally had tears in my eyes or was close to it. And this woman I know, um, who worked in a different division said, are you, are you okay? Mm -hmm. Like you look like something's wrong. Mm -hmm. She was like, it can't be that bad. It's like eight 15 in the morning mm -hmm. and realizing that I felt that way walking into work. Mm -hmm. I just, it just didn't feel right anymore. And so I had to, uh, and I, I also, I think I'm a little, I am action oriented. Mm -hmm. So if there's an issue, I want to address it. Mm -hmm. And that feeling of, I am not enjoying this place. Yeah. Uh, I just, it didn't sit, it didn't sit right with me. And so I had, I had to take action because at that point I just wasn't happy. Yeah. And I, one of my core values is happiness. And so because I wasn't happy, I had to make a change. Like it, you just feel so strongly that this is not how you are meant to live life. Yeah. Um, and that the other stuff just becomes details. I mean, that's really what it was like. It's so true. And I think that that feeling that you have that, um, almost that sad or sick feeling that you have when you go into doing something that you don't want to do, um, and, I, and it's different from, from fear of just the unknown. This is a different kind of, I would say like sick, quote unquote, sick feeling. That is your, I believe that's your internal compass telling you that something needs to change. And, and there's a distinct dis difference between that feeling and the feeling of doing something that maybe is scary, like, you know, starting your business or going live for the first time on Facebook or whatever. That's a, you feel sick, but it's in a different kind of way. You know, yeah. that feeling that makes you almost like it feels sad and it, you can feel it in the pit of your stomach. That's your internal compass and it's telling you something. And it was yeah. telling you that it's time to make a change. 
Yeah. So, and I remember having some conversations with a life coach that I had earlier and she was like, Emily, you know, I think it might be time for you to move on. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm not there yet. It's not time for me. And then after a series of events and then that feeling, yeah. um, that dread, yeah. um, then I was like, all right, yeah, I do have to make a change. Yeah. Um, and then I put, mo I put actions in place. So one was transferring uh, or reassigning who was going to do the benefits and yeah. all of that. Um, so I took those small steps to help prepare me for that. And I think that that's so powerful because I often say to people, you know, if you're getting that feeling, it doesn't mean you need to walk in and quit that day, but you do need to start making the steps, making the transition and it will happen. You know, it might happen over a month or maybe three months, but as long as you're taking little action steps to move you from to get out of that situation and into your new situation, it will, that will in itself alleviate some of that stress and pain because in your subconscious mind, you know, that you're, you're basically planning your exit. Yeah. 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 And then I also, uh, I mean, I, I still felt because I was still an employee, even after I had made this decision, I mean, one of the things that I, I, I still tried to be a really stellar employee. Yeah. So I was trying to be super productive. And I mean, even on my last day, I, I basically forced myself to stop typing up a, um, a memo at 3 p.m. on a Friday to, because I had to turn in my laptop. Uh, so I was really working all the way up into the end to try to make sure everything was taken care of. Also giving enough, I gave so much notice um, to help provide for some kind of transition to make sure my supervisor and that, that division was in the best possible position. Um, you know, I, that was something that was really important to me. And, and that's living in integrity, really like, you, you know, making that choice and making that transition out and just doing it in a way that is, like I say, is in integrity with your values. And, and I think it's also respectful, you know, it's a respectful way to, to make that transition. And I'm sure that they were proud of you and probably even though they were sad to lose you, you know, like, you know, it's, it's people, things change. Like we, my husband and I were just talking about this today. Like we have friends that are going through some stuff and it's like, you know, he's now thinking of starting something different and she's thinking of starting. And it's like life happens and changes and shifts. Right. And yeah. you're not meant to do the same thing. I don't think for your entire life. I mean, some people do, I guess, but, um, I don't know. I like yeah. to live in the flows. I think also the other thing too, which I quickly realized because as part of my big goals, when I left my agency, I'm like, all right, my goal is to make a hundred thousand dollars in my first 12 months. And a lot of people were like, Whoa, that's a lot. Yeah. <clears throat> and it is, uh, and it's a big goal. Uh, what I did not realize mm -hmm. was just the, the level of stress that I had. And I basically took the summer off and was full-time mom. Like I played with, I had a summer break, like back in school. Oh, and I let me it. tell you something. It was amazing. I bet. I bet. <laughs> um, but it was so, looking back, it was so interesting because I, at one point I was like, oh my God, I'm not ever going to, I'm not going to make my goal because I'm like spending time with the kids. And I'm like, hold up. How do I measure success? Number one, is it the hundred thousand dollars in 12 months or is it to be present with my kids and be happy? Mm -hmm. The money is secondary. So when I looked at it from that lens, I gave myself some grace and I will tell you that it wasn't until the fall where I started to feel more like myself again. Mm -hmm. And it was almost as though I was recovering from an illness. I mean, yeah. I was just like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize how, how much this had actually impacted me because I was just going through, you know, just survival mode. Yeah. I talk about that a lot about awareness and about autopilot. And a lot of times we don't realize that, you know, that feeling like you're not supposed to feel like, oh, every time you walk in the door to, to work or like that we're meant to feel happy and fulfilled and that you've got to catch yourself and be aware of those feelings so that you can make the change, right. In order to yeah. feelings. And even though it's scary, 
you know, there's, there is so much fulfillment that comes when you live in your purpose and whatever that may be. So I love that. Now tell us about what you do now and how you created this business and, and like, just take us on that journey. So you've had the time off, you've been with the kids, you've kind of had a reset. Now what? Right. So, uh, I had a, a, a little bit of background. Um, I had been doing some data visualization, which is like telling stories with data, with charts and graphs. And I had been doing that on the weekends and kind of in the pockets of my time. And what I, I mean, I love it for so many reasons, um, but I love what data can do for us, Mm -hmm. whether it's personally or for our businesses. Uh, So personally, it allows me to have a more informed conversation with my doctor. Mm. Like, I mean, we, I look at us as we are partners. I review my data before going in. So I love what it can tell us. I also, just because of kind of my background and what I've been interested in, Mm -hmm. uh, I I do network marketing as a hobby business, Mm -hmm. uh, just because I love that profession so much. Um, And just being around and also having experience in life coaching, I love the potential that data can uh, have, the impact that it can have for coaches and entrepreneurs and how it can really change things. And so uh, if I can, I I want to share a really quick example about data and its impact. So I'm on this email list for this local photographer uh, or an actor. I'm sorry, not a photographer, a... um, modeling kind of tutor, if you will. Okay. And I got this email and the subject line is a Philadelphia photographer needing a model. And I thought of you. And so I'm like, Oh, cool. I go in the email, start reading it. He's like, this photographer is looking for a slender 60 year old woman. And I immediately thought of you. And then it went on. Now, I am not a slender 60 year old woman. (laughs) And and so I actually wrote him back and said, "Uh, I don't think you did think of me because I am neither of those things. Yeah. But I was on an email list. He had not segmented that list. He hadn't tagged it. He didn't really know me. And so I think it's a really great example about why I get fired up also. Um, how I just know data can help us so much is because if he had even just surveyed his email list to say, Hey, what are the type of jobs? What is, what are the, for this uh, particular industry, it makes sense to get a little bit of physical um, attributes. Mm -hmm. What color hair, how would you describe your build? Just getting that data Mm -hmm. because that's what that is. Yep he could have really been able to really think of me when a job came through, but then that it can also inform him on other things that I'm interested in, other courses that he has. And as a result of that email exchange, when he basically said, oh no, you were just in my email list and I sent all this email to everyone. Blanketed out, yeah. Right. Um, So I just decided, well, I'm not doing business with you anymore Mm -hmm. because I, I just won't do business with you because it's just like you, you can do better and you choose not to. Yeah. Because the way I also approached him was I can help you. If you just want to hop on a call, I can give you just a couple of tips on how this can be more meaningful, more uh, helpful for you. And it was, and it wasn't like I was, um, my response wasn't to the no. It was that, he was unwilling to be open to seeing how he could be, how he could serve his clients better. Mm -hmm. And that is why I just said, you know what, I will take my money somewhere else. And that's what I tend to do. I love that. So that's what you, so as a business owner, you Mm -hmm. could, I would hire you and you would come in and you would like go through like my, my back office email stuff, like in, and try and dig up the data of who, Right. So one of the things that I love doing is 
almost doing a little audit, if you will, yeah. um, from my bank examiner past that really yeah. speaks to me. Yeah. Um, but doing hey, that, you went through that career for a purpose, right? I, right? Yeah. Um, so it's going through your process, seeing what you have now. Um, I'll share a really quick example yeah. of just how easy, how simple this can be. I mean, certainly there can be complex um, solutions, yeah. but it doesn't always have to be either. I was working with a life coach and actually he was a speaking coach and I was his client and he asked to send out an email with these 10 questions and have the person send the email back to me and then I would talk to him about it on a one-on-one -on -one call, which I think is, that might be standard business for a lot of coaches. Mm -hmm. But what I did was I said, you know, I'm actually just going to put this in a Google form I'm not changing any wording. I'm just changing the delivery channel, mm -hmm. right? So instead of email, I'm going to have a form and that form is going to populate a spreadsheet. So I sent the form out, the people inputted their answers. I added him as a contributor on the spreadsheet and the form so he could see everything that was going on. Mm -hmm. Now the benefit here is he doesn't have to wait. I mean, there's so many benefits, but we'll start with the first one. He doesn't have to wait until I have the one-on-one -on -one call with him. He mm. can see real time the type of responses that are coming in. So then when we do hop on that one-on-one -on -one call, he can say, you know, I noticed because I also completed my own form. So then I had a self-assessment and mm. others assessment of me. We could have had a super meaningful conversation around, well, Emily, it looks like you see yourself here mm -hmm. and other people see yourself over there. Let's talk about that mm -hmm. and really been able to dig in and deliver a really good conversation and really helpful advice. So not only do you start to see just by that one automation, yeah. uh, you know, solution, now you're getting data on that questionnaire. In addition to that, then you can take a look. If you do that for all of your clients, then you can start to see, well, who are the type of people I'm attracting? Mm -hmm. And does this align to the type of people I want to attract? Mm -hmm. So doing some analysis on that cohort or that class, if you will, and then rolling that up and doing an analysis or a review of the program overall. Mm. And if you just start continuing to do this over email, you're not one, you're not being efficient. Yeah. And we all know as entrepreneurs, our time is super valuable. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you or your listeners have listened to one of Chris Harder's most recent podcasts, he values his hour at $4,000. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I so, can't in there. <laughs> so, but, and, and that, you know, that seems so like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that. But, um, but our, t our time is money. And so if we are what I call in this email search and scroll, that's time we are not spending doing the things that we love. Yeah. We're doing the income producing activities, like directly income producing activities. Um, and so I just know that there's a better way. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I like to come in and do is to, if I can go through in this audit, if you will, of, our, of processes and systems and say, here are some opportunities or, you know what, you are knocking out out of the park when it comes to systems. Let's see, are there any opportunities for you to use analytics or those charts and graphs to help you make decisions? So I've done some work on how webinars have, how my webinars have performed. Okay. To see, it's almost, uh, is that webinar that I did on Google Forms, it, was that worth it for me? Did, how many subscribers did I get from that webinar? How many, and not that I had a uh, purchase, uh, not that I was asking somebody to purchase, but what you could also do is how many people purchased as a result of that webinar, instead of just kind of throwing webinars up there and yeah. seeing if they stick. Yeah. And then you can do that. <laughs> a lot of us do. I mean, like yeah. a lot of us do that. Yeah. But that's where somebody like me can come in and say, all right. So what do you, cause it all gets back to, and this is why, um, I love having these conversations because it all gets back to 
what are you curious about in your business? Mm. Um, or what do you wish was easier? And if there's an automated way to do that, let's do it. Yeah. And if I don't know the answer, at least I can identify it. And then between the two of us, we can figure out, well, who needs to do that work to implement yeah. that solution? Help them figure out where the gaps are. And then the right. solution may be, you know, we're working with somebody else or just a right. program or some software or whatever. Right. Because, and I am not uh, professing to be the end all be all when it comes to automated solutions, but I have enough experience yeah. knowing what can be helpful and then when it comes to the analytics and looking at performance, whether it's KPIs or key performance indicators, how well webinars have done, mm -hmm. uh, your funnel, mm -hmm. uh, that's another one that I love just because, again, I want to see, mm -hmm. so what is this doing for me? Yeah. Or am I just doing work and spinning wheels? Yeah. Because a lot of us don't understand. Like, I know, I know what, like, when I look at my, my statistics, like, what percentage of people are opening my emails and the percentage yeah. of people are clicking, but, like... I see those numbers and I understand what they are, but I don't know what I'm supposed to do based on what those numbers say. You know, obviously if something's really low, that tells me, okay, I need to be better at my content or I need to, you know, but how to, you know, I don't know, use that data to improve other than, you know, a low number means people didn't like it or a high yeah. number means it was, you know, keep doing more of that. <laughs> Right. And so, you know, one of the things that we had the opportunity, and this is what I loved. I thanked um, Brendan Kane mm -hmm. uh, for his talk because he was talking all about data. He was a data uh, guy for sure. Yes. I was so excited um, because when he, he was talking about Instagram and, you know, a lot of us were like, what should we do? And, and what content should we put out there? And he's like, look at the data. It'll tell you everything. Yeah. And I love that because uh, now I, I agree with him mostly. Data, I think, is a really good starting point and can tell you a lot. Um, but in the case of Instagram, yeah, then you know for your high-performing post, well, like look at the things that um, really, what are there any commonalities yeah. in those top five posts? And that's actually some work I'm doing now is to help uh, with Instagram analytics to that's provide amazing. something in that front because That's actually a huge offering because I know I have insights. Yeah. I mean, if you're listening to this right now and you're in business one, you need to make sure your Instagram profile is a business profile so that you can yeah. get the insights. I've never really looked at insights before until after and that, that week. And now I'm like really paying attention to, Oh, that one got, you know, this many views and I got four follows from that and like whatever. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, one of the things Instagram lets us see our own data, mm -hmm. but they don't make it really readable um, and very easy to consume. So I'm doing, that's the work I'm doing now is to help make it more consumable. So I cannot wait until I have a solution to provide out there. I'm actually going to, I think, start working with a developer to help with that. To try and extract um, it? Like, can you extract the data? You can, you, you, can, you can extract it. Um, it comes out in um, JSON files. Mm -hmm. um, it, and even with that, I kind of threw it into my data visualization tool. And I would just tell you that it is, it, for me, it was uh, difficult mm -hmm. to understand. So that's where you know, I want to do some of that work to help people just get to the, really, what are the big things that they're interested in? Yeah. Um, so I am really excited about some work on that front. And then the other thing that I, um, I have heard a lot of from CEOs or uh, entrepreneurs is, well, what numbers should I be paying attention to yeah. and what are good numbers? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, and as you just mentioned too, uh, and I think kind of, it depends on what the metric is. I put out, uh, this five metrics that matter. And mm -hmm. what I love about it is that three are some that I think most everybody would go, oh yeah, totally makes sense. You know, revenue, um, expenses and income. Mm -hmm. so, uh, no income. Like those are three financial ones. And there's certainly, you could there's a lot more you could do on that front, but from a big three, those are three big ones because if your revenue's going down or your expenses are going up, you know, yeah. then that's going to highlight, Hey, we need to take some action here. 
Um, but then the other two metrics that I really love are not financial metrics at all. Um, and it's about pricing for worth and, um, that's a big one. Yeah. So I put together a tool and I'll provide it. So that way your listeners um, can Mm -hmm. have the link for it, but it is based on this, uh, concept that I actually heard from Chris Harder. It may have been a year ago. Um, and it was about what is your time worth and yeah. how you kind of back into that. But I added on to actually what Chris had mentioned in that podcast. It, it was a podcast about the, the Uber driver that yeah. he had. Yes, I do. Um, but I added on this element of what's my current pricing and what do people say my product or service is worth? Mm-hmm. Because it's one thing for me to go out there and say, you know, I think that, you know, my hourly worth is 4,000 or 225 or whatever. And so I'm going to price my product accordingly. But if the market's not going to bear that, Mm -hmm. then I think that's a challenge. Mm -hmm. And so these are just other data points, right? So Mm -hmm. what the current price is and uh, what people say it's worth can give me three data points you know, worth-based pricing, current price, and others perceived value. Mm -hmm. And then I can figure out where do I fall currently Mm -hmm. and how, and then gives me some options for a pricing range. Mm -hmm. Because what I really want to do, and I've heard, I've heard this from a lot of my entrepreneur friends of, I just don't know, it feels really uncomfortable to increase my price. And and I actually just want to get rid of that uncomfortable feeling. Mm -hmm. And say, hey, instead of relying on feelings, which can be oh, kind yeah. of like we, our ego gets involved and we like, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. So take feelings out of it. I think um, there's a statistician or a, great, a mathematician who once said, my data is greater than your feelings. <laughs> so um, it's really just going all about the data. And so then I think it gives us a different posture when we're talking about our pricing, Mm -hmm. because it's no longer, I feel like my service is worth a thousand dollars. It's my service is worth a thousand dollars or whatever the thing is or the price is because people perceive that value. That's what it's, my time is worth in terms of the cost of developing it. And, um, and, and, you know, you can use that and, isn't that a much different conversation than I feel it's worth? Yeah. Because I feel is so subjective. Whereas I have data points now that say, no, this is my pricing range based on my customers who have currently used or who have used my product successfully, who, um, or whatever the perceived value is, the cost it took to build that. Mm -hmm. So that's why I love that. Cause I, you know, Get rid of that uncomfortableness. Yeah. So you created a tool where you can input, you know, what people have paid for it in the past, what you've put in time-wise kind of thing and your hourly, and then what you think it's worth or what, what you think other. So uh, so you would, you, you could do this a few different ways. I'm also building out a tool on, um, customer or perceived value uh, but you could ask, um, yeah. and you can simply yeah. ask people through even a Google form. I, I love Google Forms so much, but you could ask people, what would you have paid for this? Like yeah. when you do exit surveys with coaching clients, which is another thing that I think everybody should be doing. Yeah. Um, you know, how much would you have paid for this? Yeah. And that can give you that perceived value, you know, yeah. um, for this one coach I used, I paid nine ninety seven for his program to me, and I told him this. It was worth twenty five hundred. Yeah, just the level of service he provided. It was amazing. So you'd enter in twenty five hundred for perceived value. The current price is nine ninety seven. His cost based on his hourly worth. I'm I'm making up a number here, but maybe that's I don't know fifteen hundred. Yeah. Um, and so then he can really say, well, I really have a pricing range between 997, my current price, that's the low end to 2,500. Now, 
where, how do I want to price it? And there is some uh, strategies that you can employ, whether it's, you know, I don't want to go from 997 to 2,500, or maybe you do, you go all in, or maybe you take that middle ground of 1,500 and go, well, let's start here. And let's hype up the fact that this is going to be short term because I'm going to be increasing my prices soon. Yeah. So get now. And I teach that to my students too. It's like, you have to test the pricing, right? Like I've done things where I put them out there thinking that, you know, looking at the time that I put into them and thinking like I had, you know, hours and hours of time invested into creating the content and building it all out. And I could see the perceived value, but then it didn't fly. Right. Like nobody else saw the same value. Right. Because, you know, I thought it was valuable, but they didn't. So yeah. you have to test some of these things, you know, put that's right out there and see where, you know, see what, see what does stick. Um, and then, and then kind of go from that area. Yeah. And I always say when you're doing any type of testing or anything like that, I mean, just write those little notes down because mm-hmm. they can become, that can become data for future yeah. use. Mm -hmm. And so if it's a matter of it's handwritten now, hey, that's cool. You can get a VA to come in and put that in a spreadsheet or somebody like me who would, who could take uh, that spreadsheet and make it a little more useful for some reporting to induce some analysis on it. Um, But just get started. I think that's one of the that's kind of my second point. You know, there's be curious and then get started, take some action, collect data. Because I mean, I've been in the same boat where I was creating a course. I didn't keep track of my time because I had already negotiated the pricing and everything. Mm -hmm. And I was like, afterwards, I was like, oh, darn it. I really should have kept track of that because I put in a lot of time and I wonder really what my hourly Mm -hmm. rate was for Mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. I know much lower than my consulting rate. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And the thing is, is, you know, because I think people undervalue even their rate because they think like, you know, whatever they're thinking, but you know, I, and even just like I had this conversation today with one of the students in my, in my group coaching and she's a naturopathic doctor and she does all these things. And when she was coming up with her pricing, I said, you have to factor in the years of education and experience that you've had, like that, there's value to that in your mm-hmm. hourly pricing. Like you can't just say, well, you know, I think I'm worth this much because you're not factoring that in. And a lot of times I think what happens is, is new entrepreneurs think, well, because I'm new, I need to make my products cheaper because I'm new at this. Well, you may be new at this, but you have all this experience and education that has led up to this point and that has value. So don't yeah. discount it because you're new. That's a mistake that I totally made myself too. Yeah. And yes. And I have seen that in data visualization or that data and analytics consulting where, uh, where my pricing, because I, I also look at what the market bears in this area for mm-hmm. local work. And so I have to think about how I am in that range. But then I had a really great conversation with other consultants around the country and they were like, Emily, you have to increase your price because you don't understand what it's doing to the rest of the market Mm -hmm. because it's driving everything down and you're worth more. Just as you said, you're worth more than your rate because you have 20 years of analyzing bank data. So you have those analytical skills. You understand how to analyze data and information. Um, I've also uh, communicated, I've presented to heads of the federal regulatory agencies before and um, been in meetings uh, with significant senior or executive managers of major like global banks. So, you know, all of that stuff, just as you say, that factors into what you're Mm -hmm. worth. And it's not only what you think you're worth, but also what the market, the the value to the market. Mm -hmm. So for example, I could do a, uh, and I will be releasing soon a CEO dashboard. And that helps keep track of some of those five metrics that I talked about. I love that. And I mean, just, I, there's so much value in seeing quickly seeing where you're at with your numbers. So, you know, the time it takes for me to build that out, 
that might be on the smaller side, but the value it can provide to people is yeah. immense, especially if you're not a data person. And I get not everybody gets super excited. And like you saw me dancing in my chair when Brendan yeah. Kane was talking about data. Like I realize, I mean, I don't understand it. I'm just kidding. Um, but everybody doesn't get as excited about it as I do. But that's awesome though, because Let's do what we're all best at yeah. and understand that um, it can be helpful and we all have our own things and it's okay. You don't have to do every single thing for your company. You do, you work on the content you love, let the numbers, mm -hmm. you know, let somebody else handle that like me. Well, and the value, right? Like, so as a, as a, as somebody like myself who doesn't, you know, dig into the numbers and I am like, I am completely, I think I'm, what am I right brained? I'm super creative, like the, the creative and the putting the pieces yeah. together and seeing the vision, all those things where the numbers just kind of, I just don't, it just, it doesn't function in my brain as well. That's important to me. And that has a massive amount of value. So maybe it only took you two hours to create that, but I would pay, you know, cause that would help me in my business would help me grow my business. And that's, I love that. And we learned that at the mastermind with, with Kayla, like it was about, it's not necessarily what you think your product's worth. It's about what the value it has for the person who's purchasing it. Yeah. You know, like yeah. I help people start their businesses. They could have multi-million dollar businesses thanks to going through yeah. my coaching and that has value, right? right. Same with yours. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, that's just like with Google form. I mean, again, I go back to Google forms, like those little tweaks can really make a big difference in your business yeah. because what it does is it allows, it provides you some additional, uh, services and additional polish. Like yeah. when I was talking to this life coach that I work with and he was like, you know, I think that it gives me a little extra mm -hmm. something. And what that something is, is a point of differentiation. Mm. Because now he's using data in a way that other people like him are not. Yeah. And so now he can have personalized analytic, a personal uh, client report, a personalized client report that's based on the data. And now he can also then serve his clients better. Mm -hmm. And I, while I kind of my company's um, informal motto is learn more, earn more. Mm, but as part of that is kind of um, embedded in that is two things. One is serving your clients better mm -hmm. because without clients, I mean, you, you don't yeah. earn more, <laughs> um, sure. but I have this really big value of serving servant leadership. So serving your clients better. Mm -hmm. And then once you earn more, doing more good with that money, uh, whether that's investing or giving back or whatever the case is. So that's why I love what data can do for us because I see that possibility and I get so fired up to the point where, uh, when I was starting to work with that life coach, I was so excited. I wrote out, um, a strategy for him and then also included other considerations, which I told him, you can take them or leave them, but these are just some things that you might want to think about. Um, because I was that excited that I wanted to help and was so excited that he saw the value that mm -hmm. data had and how it could really uplevel his business. I'm totally so, you're going like, okay, we need to talk after this because like, <laughs> I need to get through my, and you know, it's funny because I did just do, I, I have a survey going right now for my audience to try and, you know, for me, I was trying to collect data on what are the things that they need to hear about? Where, where are they struggling and how can I create content that is going to help them um, versus me just creating content that I think that they want, right? right? And uh, it allows me to be more specific in, in what I'm doing and also, you know, be able to, like, I, I hate to use the word target, but to, to get the messages to the right people, to target the right people with the right messages. And so, um, you know, I'm not doing it probably in the best capacity of my survey probably could be better thanks to your help. So we're definitely going to have to talk after this, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's making sure that you're getting the right information to the right people. And that's what the data collecting that data allows you to do. So it allows yeah. you to, to be better with your clients, but it also allows you to attract in more of the right people by, you know, learning who's out there and listening to your stuff and what do they want? What do they need? Right. It's all about 
serving better. You yeah. can't serve people if you're out of business because you've spent too much because you didn't keep an eye on expenses. Yeah. You can't serve people if you're not pricing your products to what they are worth and what the market can bear. Um, and so all of this is so important. And I mean, you can, you can do it. It's not like, you know, everything has to be, you know, so computer based, but I will tell you, it makes life a whole heck of a lot easier. Yeah. And the one thing that I recently, um, I guess it was last year, I discovered this tool called Interact and it's a quiz maker and it is so good for data. I love it so much. Like I am digging in because you create a quiz and uh, because I have the consultant level, I can see when people drop off, I can see what their answers are mm. and, and you can give them different calls of actions based on the results, which I think is, that's a big benefit. But here's what I love about this that is a feature that, I mean, for me, I saw immediately. Let's say you have this quiz out there and you see people are responding a certain way to a question. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're doing a podcast, and we'll just use that as an example, yeah. maybe that question, you can create a whole podcast around that because oh. people have said yes or no, whatever the um, question is. Oh. <laughs> so I love what that's doing. One, it's engaging with our customers or our potential customers, mm -hmm. but then two, we have data now to provide us some additional content. Yeah. And so that's just another great way. Um, and then it's also driving them to a really good, meaningful call to action instead of just a generic visit my website. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying that you do that, but no. you know, there are I'm people giving away that, gift card. <laughs> I'm doing a contest if you fill out my survey. Yeah. But yeah. You know, like it's, it's not a quiz. It's just, Hey, you fill out the survey for a chance to win, but yeah. yeah. But and, no, yeah. but that's something that I think is coming. I, I think there's a big potential there that we haven't tapped into yet. Yeah. And I love that. Yeah. Like you can tell, like, I like, let's go, let's create quizzes. I can totally um, see that. And that's the thing is, I, I feel like that's a good point to bring up is that, you know, when you're in alignment with what your purpose is, when you're talking about it and doing it, and it just literally lights you up and fires you up. Like that's another piece of the compass puzzle. It's like when you feel good and energetic, like you do, like your whole face lights up when you start talking about data, like, you know, you're, <laughs> You were put on this earth, girl, to, to, to do this kind of yeah. work. I love so, um, you know, one of the things that I love, um, I, mean, I love data, but I also have really big goals for my company uh, and for myself because while I love helping people in servant leadership and that's a core value of mine and I love helping entrepreneurs, it's to me bigger than even that because I feel so strongly about the gender gap within women in STEM, so science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, I am doing a lot of work with middle schoolers, but then I created a women's empowerment initiative that um, has a few different branches to it, but one of them is educational um, scholarships mm -hmm. for educational expenses. And so part of my mission, it's a social impact kind of company, really. I know that that's a buzzword that some people like and not, but for me, it's just part of who I am. So when I make a certain amount of money, the excess of that will then help go fund mm. the scholarship. And so last year when I didn't have my consultancy, I was able to do a $500 scholarship and the girl who won that was... Uh, so great. Um, she's at University of Maryland studying biology and hopes to become a doctor. Um, but that's why I'm here because $500 is a book. And yeah. I eventually want to pay for multiple girls education yes. to help them. And it all with me starts with that community outreach in middle school and help support them to get to college and then continue on with some of the resources that, or the work that I do in volunteering um, to help women in their data and technology related careers. So that's what this is about for me. I love it. I love it. What a, what a way to, um, you know, kind of close this t chat out is on the way of like, you know, doing what you love 
but then finding a way to also give back with it. And I think that's beautiful. It's, it's just so amazing. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much. I, so I do too. I know. And I, and I say this at the end of every interview because it truly is how I feel when I get on these chats with, with all these amazing entrepreneurs and people that I'm meeting in my life. It's like, we could sit here and talk forever. <laughs> we know. literally could. Um, I love this. Now you have, okay. So I know you're working on some tools and things, and there's a lot of those tools that you talked about that I, as soon as they're ready, I need to get my hands on them. But where can people basically come to you right now? Maybe get on your email list so that when these things are ready, or if they want to hire you for your services and get some of the data, um, you know, in their businesses, where should they go to find you right now? So right now, um, analytics, the number two inform.com is my website. I have free resources that are up there currently. So the what's it worth tool is already up there. Um, I do have the five metrics that matter. Yep. There's a pop-up that people can just enter to get that download to okay. start looking at that. And by the time this goes live, I will have the CEO tracker. So helping not so understanding what those metrics are to then tracking them. And then next that. step is that dashboard. So um, you can find me, just connect with me on uh, through my website or it, I love Instagram. So I'm on Instagram a lot. You can find me at Emily Kuhn or at analytics, the number two inform. I love it. And we'll put those links and everything in the show notes so people can go there to find them. And you can get the show notes at chainofrecord.com. And if you guys are loving this episode today, if you're listening to this on your phone and you're like totally geeking out over the data like we are, I want you to screenshot it and send it or put it up in your Insta story because we both love Instagram and tag both Emily and I so that we can send you some love back and send you some thanks and, and, and hop into your DMs and, and chat with you. Um, we love when people share these episodes because that's as entrepreneurs, the sharing is a huge part of how we grow and how we get our messages out there. So i um, grateful for you guys if you can do that. And Emily, thank you so much for this. I am excited to learn more about my own data. So we're going to yes. have a chat. I know as you've actually got me excited about the numbers. <laughs> Yay! Oh, okay, mission accomplished. I I have my little data unicorn here just in case. Oh I that's, that's hilarious. And if you guys can't see it, it's a unicorn. It's got, it's like literally barfing rainbow. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, that's how I feel when I talk about data. <laughs> there's just so much information. Right. And I think that's some, for some of us, it's like, it's like my brain just can't handle all of those numbers all at once. Right. And so I just shut out. Yeah. And you know what? Like, that's a really I, important yeah. point. I, I meet, I meet people where they're at. Yeah. So I am not expecting, and I, I really don't expect to come in and offer this super complex, elegant solution. Like, I want to know where are you at and let's work from there Yeah. because getting people overwhelmed and cringing about data does nobody any good. Yeah, no, I love that. I'm glad you said that because that can literally stop people from, you know, moving yeah. forward and in, into the data because they're afraid of the numbers literally. And that that's, that's me. Like when it comes to tax time and I have to actually make a chart and put all my numbers in, I'm grateful that I can just like highlight a whole column and the totals at the bottom, you know, like yeah. that makes me excited, but yep. like, you know, putting all that information in and working on that stuff, it's always such a stress. So, um, but yeah, no, I do believe it's important. And I think as you grow, if it, it's more and more important because you need to know these things to be able to be effective and to make sure you're not wasting money and to make sure you're profitable yeah. and that you're doing all the right things. So very valuable. So thank you, Emily, so much for being here and sharing your wisdom with the audience today. I can't wait to dig into my own numbers and you guys check out Emily's website. Um, check her out on Instagram, give her a follow and um, just so happy that you were here today. Emily, thank you again. Thank you so much for having me. Reach out anytime that you or your listeners have any questions, please. That would mean the world to me. I love it. Thank you.